Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, I am John Delin, your host. It is March 7th, 2024, and we kind of have some uh, some recent news th that uh, we are honored and uh, uh, humbled but excited to share. Today, we're going to be talking about um, BYU-Idaho disinviting trumpet uh, player and professor Ryan Nielsen um, from a jazz festival that uh, is coming up. And uh, we're going to be giving you kind of the full story, but just the quick story is uh, Ryan Nielsen and his amazing uh, partner, Holly, came on Mormon Stories right at the beginning of the pandemic and talked about um, kind of spiritual abuse and even suicidality um, uh, as Ryan was a, a professor at BYU-Idaho and how he uh, kind of lost his faith and transferred to Utah Valley University. And he's a jazz player, a, a trumpet player, a jazz musician, and he's a professor of jazz. And uh, we're going to be talking about that more. But uh, recently he was invited uh, to uh, continue both playing at, uh, but also speaking or presenting um yeah i was invited to perform at the jazz festival and also to, to just teach basically high school students basic jazz improvisation yeah mm -hmm. and originally he was invited it's something that he's done how many years several times since yeah. the interview actually so oh, this yeah. was really an unusual experience and then just out of the blue he was disinvited and long story short he found out I think you have been given the impression, I don't want to reveal any potential sources if there are sources, but you you have been led to believe that you were disinvited literally because you spoke publicly about your experience at BYU-Idaho and your faith transition, and maybe just for coming on Mormon Stories. So, I think that's accurate. Yeah. So we're going to be just kind of telling that whole story, both for those interested uh, but also for the public record that, uh, you know, that this happened. So that's kind of what today's going to be about. Uh, we've got some visuals, but but Ryan Nielsen, uh, welcome back to, to Mormon Stories Podcast. Thanks, John. And I'm it's, sorry we have to be here. It's good. Yeah. I, under these circumstances. I know. It would be more fun other, under other circumstances, <laughs> but here we are. Okay, um, and we are live streaming today, so I'm going to do my best to follow. It looks like Maven's in the chats. Um, we're gonna we're gonna welcome uh, your questions and comments to the extent that Maven's able to star them and flag them. I will do my best to incorporate some of your questions or comments. We hope uh, we welcome BYU Idaho students, BYU Idaho faculty administration, and. Just BYU students worldwide and also just members of the church and never Mormons, everyone, we welcome you all here because we think this story has important implications for education within a Mormon context, for freedom of speech, uh, for just empathy and compassion and uh, respect for different points of view. There's probably a lot of values that we could highlight. For did, sure. just, did I miss any big ones or did I don't I don't think so. No. <laughs> Um, I, I guess at BYU, the the questions around academic freedom are never going to go away. <laughs> Probably not. They were certainly there when I was there. Yeah. But um, if you have questions or comments, please do feel free to share them, and um, uh, we'll do our best to get them in. Anyway, um, all right. So, uh, Ryan, I think you wanted to begin with intentions. Is that I right? I do. This is very similar to what how we how I started the interview last time, but... One of the reasons I really wanted to come on is um, to sort of complexify where I'm coming from. And I just want to say out loud um, that at the core of who I'm, who I am is a profound trust for the interior lives of all of the people who I love. And so if someone is if someone feels called to be in the LDS church, I believe them a hundred percent. If somebody is in that middle ground of wrestling to find their place there, even though literalism has fallen away, I believe them a hundred percent. And if someone uh, like me feels like they had to leave uh, the faith of their upbringing in order to care for their own well-being, 
I also believe them. So um, one of the things, one of the reasons I wanted to come on is because I've had some um, pretty interesting labels kind of tossed my way, uh, suggesting that I might be somehow anti-Mormon or um, or even anti-Christ, and I, that just simply is not an accurate representation of where I'm coming from. So I hope that I can humanize everyone involved in talking about this, and hopefully there are no caricatures of anyone. Hopefully nobody comes out appearing to be the fall guy or the bad guy, and hopefully we can all just kind of share in the paradox of this situation because my experience of it is that the the things that really did hurt for me in being disinvited by people who I know and love, uh, it was their sense of their faith that led them to, to ban me from campus as a speaker or performer. But at the same time, like the massive support that I received from so many people also came from their sense of their faith as practicing members of the LDS church. And both of those things are true side by side. So it feels really important to me to just hold a space for both those opposites to live next to each other. Um, the other reason I really want to come on as far as intentions go is uh, I've spent the last few years studying quite a bit about the nature of trauma just for my own growth. And one of the concepts that I've kind of fallen in love with is this idea of telomeres. Now, I'm not a doctor, so I might get some of this wrong, but in reading Gabor Mate's um, writings, he talks about telomeres, which are basically this, this thing that exists in our DNA that more or less predicts how long we'll live. I'm sure that's an oversimplification. But anyways, um, and that one of the things that grows telomeres is people standing up for themselves. And when I realized that I was afraid of speaking on Mormon stories again. That is also when I realized that I needed to uh, so that I wasn't living in a way that was giving into those fears. And so I do feel kind of afraid to be here today, honestly. Um, and, but I'm also very grateful to be here. And then the last thing I want to do is just sort of put to bed. I've had several uh, people point out the fact that BYU-Idaho is a private institution and that they have every right to, to disinvite or ban people from campus. And I totally agree with that statement. <laughs> so I'm not here to argue with that. At the same time, I am here to suggest that it, or just to share the fact that it really hurt uh, when they did that. And uh, I think it was meant to um, in some ways. And in other ways, I think it was just a tragic misunderstanding. So those are my intentions from the outset. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, and I, I appreciate that. And I don't think when you came on Mormon Stories the first time your intent was to lead people out of the church no. or to erode faith. It was just to tell your story. Yeah. And I do this, is it telomeres? Is that the word? Telomeres, You're, yeah. Yeah, I want to <laughs> learn more about that. But I just want to say that, like, I have just anecdotally seen not just oppression, but also anger and suicidality associated with keeping things hidden, keeping anger and frustration bottled up, and presenting to the world um, a, a state of reality that isn't authentic. Mm -hmm. I think authenticity uh, is essential to our mental health. And so uh, my anecdotal experience observing people's mental health jives with what you just shared about the importance of speaking up versus the potential deleterious effects and or lethality mm. of um of just quietly shrinking and allowing a person to either just be kept silent or to be abused without totally. without speaking up that's one of the things that i love about Gabra Matei and the way he talks about trauma is that he says there are two basic human needs. One is attachment and the other is authenticity. 
and that many of us gave up our relationship to our authenticity in order to maintain attachment relationships. And so anytime that we give up that authenticity, we kind of experience a re-traumatization of original wounds. So that resonates with me so much. Yeah. So. Well, um, and I do want to refer people to that original episode. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. But yeah. You and your wife, uh, Holly, are just amazing humans. And I was m touched to move by you then. Maybe we'll re, maybe, you know, some of these episodes we cut up into one hour chunks. And so they're like four or five hours, four or five episodes. <laughs> we, we need to just kind of munge those together and, mm -hmm. and reshare them. But we're on this kick of like, where are they now kind of thing. Yeah. We just interviewed, re-interviewed David Bakavoy oh. on Mormon Stories. And he kind of gave an update. Yeah. So you'll be the kind of the second Oh, uh, maybe we'll have you. Well, you're kind of the first, first aired but second recorded kind of where are they now Mormon stories episode. Cool. So that's kind of fun. Yeah, um, absolutely. Happy to talk about that. <clears throat> okay. So really quickly, um, let's see. I want to make sure. Okay. Before we uh, jump into uh, the reception of the Mormon stories interview, I just want to show a little bit about who you are and what you do. Sure. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show a visual or two. The first one I'm going to show is just your YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. It's called Ryan's Trumpet. Mm -hmm. It's on YouTube. Why don't you just talk to us about that first year, just your status as a performer? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I the, the as a performer, uh, I... I perform a lot of classical and jazz music, um, and I play trumpet in the Kobe Watkins group Tet, and I've had the opportunity to record with just some really exciting artists who inspire me. Um, and yeah, I, I go to universities and teach about jazz because I love it, <laughs> and teach about trumpet because I love it, and my YouTube channel was basically the... What I wanted to do with that was just create a community of people and create content to support kids who just don't have the um, the means to get private instruction on an instrument. It's just it's just too expensive for a lot of kids. So I thought I'm going to start creating these videos to help uh, primarily young trumpeters get information that's really helpful. And it's been it has far surpassed my expectations. I thought that may, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be cool if a few hundred people watched this? And just yesterday, got my 5,000th subscriber to the channel and have had over 200,000 views, um, which I'm just really excited about. And I've had the opportunity to meet trumpeters literally from all over the world, from LA to London, to Turkey, to South America. Like it just, um, it's been amazing. So the reception of that has been really exciting. Uh, so as a performer and as a teacher, that's kind of a nice place to see what I do and uh, for anyone interested. Yeah. Yeah, and it's great. I, I, it's always fun for me because you perform in a little. Is it a trio or a quartet? Mm -hmm. And you're you're often playing at the Caputos in downtown Holiday. Yeah, it's always fun to see y'all tear it up. Yeah, man, it's a good time. Yeah, love the music. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you're kind so. of a trumpet musician first, a jazz trumpet jazz musician first. As a yeah, yep, professionally, yep, absolutely. And then, and then I just thought I'd play a little bit of your uh, sure. your jazz. Is that okay? Yeah, please. You have to put your earphones on to hear it. But here's just a little sense of the jazz and the trumpet jazz that Ryan Ryan does. Let's roll the tape. Beautiful. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's beautiful stuff. Like, uh, that's, uh, how does it feel to be a jazz trumpet performer? Uh, it, well, with the, with that group of musicians, that was from a session earlier this year. It's kind of a dream come true for me. Those are, 
musicians who are I've admired for uh, decades. Uh, uh, and it's just uh, the thing I love about jazz um, is the way that it values authenticity but requires you to create space for other people to have their authenticity as well. There's, you can't perform jazz well from a place of dogma it's all about empathy but also like the unrestrained completely confident statement of where you are in that moment um and collaborating with other musicians that way with that spontaneity and creativity it's improvised music we're literally making it up as we play and uh i love it <laughs> i just love i love it so much so that's beautiful yeah Okay, so in addition to being a performer, mm -hmm. you also are a professor. You mm -hmm. have a PhD, among other things. Yeah. Talk about your academic credentials and then what what types of classes you teach. Okay. Especially, you know, in the context of this Jazz Fest. Sure. And then let's also talk about the book that's about to come out. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I have a Master's of Music in Classical Trumpet Performance, which I got from Arizona State University, go Sun Devils. And I have a <laughs> doctoral degree from in jazz performance from the New England Conservatory of Music. Um, and that's where I studied with John McNeil, who is the co-author with me on this book that's being published by Oxford University Press. Let me just go ahead and show it. It's called sure. The Classroom Guide to Jazz Improvisation. Mm -hmm. And that's you, that's John McNeil, Mc yeah. and you. Exactly. So John McNeil is a mentor of mine who is a kind of a legend, not only as a player, but also as a teacher. Like I would say a conservative estimate of like gigging musicians in New York who have studied with John is probably 30 to 40% of them worked with him at some point. He's just hugely influential. And he's... Um, a groundbreaking pedagogue in my opinion and so this book i'm so excited and grateful to have been able to do it with him because it's bringing to the foreground ways he's been thinking about teaching for a long time coupled with my experience teaching uh he you know he's been teaching at new england conservatory or had for nearly 40 years so really students with a lot of experience who were coming to him and then my teaching has been really largely with students with a lot of remedial needs and which sort of it was a great team for putting together this book on the on how to help kids get excited about and feel capable improvising so um just out of the blue i cold contacted the senior editor of oxford a few years ago and told him about the project and they were immediately interested and i'm thrilled that it has ended up <laughs> where it is and that gets published in april so it can be delivered by May 7th from Amazon. So I love it. Okay, yeah. so everyone, I'm sure everyone's going to want to run on buy that. So everyone <laughs> yeah, that's go right. right. Buy that book. Anybody who wants to learn how to <laughs> improvise, that's, that's the book I always wished I'd had. Yeah. It is a step-by-step, -step, nuts and bolts, let's get rid of the mystique around this and, and have fun doing it. So. Okay. Okay, and so when you normally go to the BYU-Idaho Jazz Festival, mm -hmm. uh, what what... What are the types of things you do or talk about? Um, I'll, I've done sessions where I talk to, it's all with high school students, right? So I'm basically there to help affirm a positive relationship between high schools and BYU-Idaho and, and myself. And so um, I'm there to get kids excited about playing jazz and trumpet. So I'll talk about basics of trumpet technique or basics of improvisation. And this year I was supposed to go up and just host jam sessions with the with the high school students. They... It's an amazingly well-run festival, um, and it's really student first. It's really beautiful that way. And so they make sure that there are rooms where there are actual jam sessions happening that are hosted by professionals every year, and the students get to go in and just play together, which is how we really learn the music. So that's all that I was supposed to do that and then uh, perform a couple of times that night. Um, on them, there are three nights of the jazz festival. I was supposed to perform on all three of them. And so. be super honest. How often do you needle the BYU Idaho students about their faith? <laughs> Never. How often do you bring up like polyandry or peepstones or? <laughs> 
literally never the masonry and the temple ceremony <laughs> yeah that's not a thing we're i'm mean, just there to teach jazz it's like that's all it how is how do you bear your ex-mormon testimony <laughs> to the yeah, BYU right. students literally never. okay snide comments about mormon church leadership how often never i mean I'd be honest so. I'm being totally this is honest. the internet, you know, this is yeah, the internet. Yeah, that's right. We can't have, no, yeah. No, I just, I don't, that, for one, I'm being sarcastic. For, for one thing, that's like boring to me, <laughs> you know, like, let's, like, no thanks. But the other thing life's is, bigger than yeah, that. life's yeah. bigger than that. And then the other thing is that, like, I just, it, I really trust those students. Like, if their inner lives are calling them to that place, then that's where I will support them being. Okay. That's it. Okay. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so, <let, laughs> um, thanks for being a good sport about those questions. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let's talk quickly just about your Mormon stories interview. I'll just yeah. show a screenshot. It's like a seven parter. That's a photo of you with Holly, mm -hmm. your amazing, uh, artistic, brilliant wife. Yeah. And, um, it's called Spiritual Abuse and Suicidality at BYU-Idaho, Ryan and Holly Nielsen. I really, really strongly recommend that people go back and watch it again. We may do a remix up of it where we put it all into one episode and release it because it's that good. Mm. But can you just spend a minute or two and give a recap of why you why you did that Mormon stories? Again, what what was what was the basic story in like one to two minutes? Of, of of that Mormon story? The basic story was one of me really, really trying to find a way to stay in Mormonism uh, after Holly left. And it was also a story of Holly and Mai's mutual support for each other in our personal paths. Um, a one of the most um, poignant moments of the interview when I listened back to it was when Holly, I had never, she had never told me this, but she was, while she was totally supportive of me trying to find a way to stay, she was also worried that I might fall into rigid, um, more patriarchal approaches to the faith. And she lost her faith over what? She lost... Uh, Just if summary, I mean... It's so hard, right? Patriarchy the, stuff, right? Yeah, she was... She was. She she came into the world sensing a need for more equity and inclusion in the world. <laughs> so, um, so for her, that was kind of her breaking point, which sort of happened in Boston while we were living there for school. Uh, I was going through my own journey with mental illness and uh, and the crux of my journey in terms of was was really one of being brought to a crisis point th with depression and suicidality where I realized that part of the system that was contributing to that was my relationship to the church. And then over many years coming to accept that I actually needed to step away from it in order to stay well. So... That's, and is that? And how did this come to a head at BYU Idaho specifically while you were working there? Uh, what was really hard about that situation is that um, since Holly Holly actually resigned from the church in 2011, right after we returned from Boston to BYU Idaho, and um, and that is when I became sort of suspect in the eyes of my ecclesiastical leaders, leaders, my local clergy, who started to see me as suspicious, to say the least. And I started getting hauled in for annual endorsement interviews, in air quotes, because those don't actually exist. I was the only faculty member at BYU-Idaho that I knew who was having that happen on a regular basis. And I experienced that as being uh, incredibly stressful and abusive and... Um, and it just kept happening over and over again, even when we would change wards. Um, and eventually it was, it was simply not worth it to me. Uh, and I, start, I talked with the uh, vice president at the time who said, who I said, I just need to know that if a bishop decides to go rogue and um, come after me, that BYU-Idaho will have my back. And he said that they could not do that. And so then I started applying to leave and came down to UVU. 
So years of incredibly stressful ecclesiastical abuse that I was told to my face by those leaders had to do with the fact that I had chosen to stay with Holly and uh, that I did not force my children to come to church with me. So, Yeah, and so your intent when you did that episode, mm -hmm. just to summarize that. My intent with that episode really had It wasn't to, to throw the church or even BYU-Idaho no. administration under the bus not or even to bash BYU-Idaho? No, definitely not. Um, it was part, part of the intention was just the reality of how alone I felt while I was trying to figure things out and how these Mormon stories interviews were literal lifesavers for me. So thank you. And the other part of it was that what shocked me as I was, was we were getting ready to move more and more of my female colleagues at BYU, Idaho sort of like came to me and started telling me about their concerns around sexual harassment as it related to their experience with ecclesiastical endorsements. And so the, so one of the episodes on there is me doing my best. They had asked me to speak about it because they feel like they can't. And that sort of startled me and was a part of the intention for that episode for those for the first interview. Yeah. And I just knowing you and Holly, like this idea that y'all are sort of like trying to take anyone down or even really trash anyone or besmirch the good name of the church or BYU. That's just not who y'all are. It's, in my opinion, I it's I, it's not you like, are you are right. <laughs> That's yeah. not who we are. Yeah, you just kind of so. you, you felt like hearing other people's stories helped you through really hard times. Yes, and you maybe were hopeful, like many, that sharing your story might be helpful to a few people out there. Definitely, that was a huge part of it, and the reception of it. Bared that out. So well, yeah, let's, so now let's go to that part. Yeah, a lot of people reached out to us. People like like leaders in the church who reached out to me, like stake presidents and bishops, who said thank you, because they felt like it helped them better meet the needs of their um, of their congregations. Um, and then people who were really struggling with mental illness who felt a real resonance with with what we shared. Um, people who had left the church who felt supported by what we shared. So what was fascinating to me about the reception is it was both sides of the aisle, people from all walks that felt like it was really helpful. And that was, we were so grateful for that, that so overwhelmingly positive feedback. Yeah. 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 And it's definitely was one of my favorite experiences of just experiencing a couple of guests. I, I grew to love y'all mm. kind of uh, immediately. It was fun for me to visit Holly's uh, master's art yeah. project thesis at the U of U a couple of years ago. Yeah. And just to kind of keep the friendship going. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. was very cool. Yeah. yeah. And that's, and if anyone's interested in seeing that, it's still online at IWillNotVanish.com. Yeah. So we'll make sure Julia out. includes that in the show <laughs> yeah. notes. I will not vanish .com. It's, not that I'm biased, but I'm so moved by Holly's art. Yeah. She's just. Yeah, for sure. She's kind of a badass. We'll so. have Julia maybe post that um, in yeah. the show notes and maybe even right now uh, I'll try and post it. Okay. So uh, here's a screenshot of the BYU-Idaho uh, Jazz Festival mm -hmm. front page. And it's, you know, February 20, it says February 24th, so yeah, it's already it happened. Was, it already happened, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, some famous g g guest jazz artist was there. Do you want to say who that is? Yeah, Melissa Aldana, who is one of my favorite living musicians. She's authenticity embodied in sound. So I, I, I was so excited to get to collaborate with her. You were going to play with her? I was supposed to play with her. Okay. And okay. her music is so beautiful yeah. and that I didn't get to. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. So that kind of takes us up to kind of then maybe we should start by 
um, you know, you getting invited. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So, uh, early in the fall, my friend up at BYU, Idaho reached out to me to ask me if I'd be interested in coming. And I was very interested, uh, in part because this festival was supposed to also have an alumni band to honor one of my mentors and colleagues from BYU, Idaho, who, uh, just, uh, handed over the jazz area a year or two ago to another colleague of mine. And so, um, I was really excited to reconnect with everybody and honor him. And so I did not hesitate to accept the invitation. Um, and so then in November, they said, and sorry, you've already mm -hmm. made this point, but I just want to yeah. remake it since your Mormon stories interview right before COVID or right at the mm -hmm. beginning of COVID you have performed or, or attended and performed at this, this conference, not only this festival, but this also festival. other times at BYU, Idaho. So, the, yep. so for years you've been attending this festival and performing at BYU Idaho since your Mormon Stories interview. Correct. Okay. Yeah, because That's I mean, so we weird. just we have really. <laughs> I just I love my. And friends. why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't I? You have colleagues there. I love You're them. respected in your field. Yes. You know how to play. You know how to teach. Mm -hmm. And why wouldn't academia be able to transcend? Faith politics, basically. That's a great question. Yeah. Okay. Kind of a heartbreaking <laughs> one. So, okay. Um, but the, yeah. So in November, the, they have to send up the name of every guest artist up the chain to get approved to come to campus. That's always or how it's been, or at least for a long time, it's been that way. And so, um, so in November, they sent my name up and it got signed off at every level. Oh, wow. And so. Um, <clears throat> like all the past years. Oh, I like all the past years. And then yeah. I, and then, um, and they absolutely knew about the Mormon stories interview. Um, anyways, uh, so come to the day before I'm supposed to head up to the festival. What? Yeah. The day before I'm supposed to head up, I get a phone call, uh, from my dear, dear friend. And the second he says, Hey, I can hear something's wrong. And he was absolutely devastated and brokenhearted, but he'd been called into a meeting with the dean and the chair, and the dean informed uh, him that um, I was being disinvited and, in fact, would not um, be welcome to come back as a performer or a teacher in any capacity on campus again. So he was devastated. He felt sick that he had that. First off, it's kind of messed up that the dean had him call me because it was... Someone else should have called me, but my buddy did, and he was incredibly gracious, and we were both really sad about it. But it hit me so hard. I was startled by the intense physicality of my response to it. I was able to notice in the moment that my body was absolutely shaking and that my jaw was trembling. I couldn't stop it. Um, like science, physical signs of shock, right? Like... Um, and that might sound dramatic to some people. Some people might go, oh, it's come on. It's just a conference. It's just a festival. Yeah. Talk about why it was so emotionally impactful. And some would say, oh, come on. You don't believe the church is true anymore. And, and like, you know, like, why would this, you know, you should expect it almost. Right. And I don't mean to be disrespectful. No, not at I all. I want to get to the emotion of what you're feeling. So, hmm. You're good at asking those questions, John. <laughs> for me, it was not easy for me to leave. It wasn't even what part of me wanted. It was more like, I either do this or die. And you're saying the church, and not BYU-Idaho. Yeah, BYU leaving Idaho, the church yeah. and even leaving BYU-Idaho. I mean, the most I've cried in the last many years was grief about leaving BYU Idaho, leaving my colleagues who I love, leaving my students who I loved. Um, it was really, really, really hard. And there was, and I was always profoundly grateful that my friends and colleagues up there continued to affirm our relationship by inviting me to these kinds of things. It felt so generous and compassionate. And just to say again, it is an it is a natural outgrowth of their approach to their faith for them to treat me that way. So, and it felt just so important to me 
to have this last tie to them. And, um, and then it was gone. It was like, that's over. That can't happen anymore. And, um, so it was, so it was just devastating. It was just like, cause I love those people so much. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, that's what comes up for me right now. Mm. It just, I love those people. Yeah. And now I don't get to go up and connect with them as musicians, as people, those, those friends of mine and I share, share a faith in our shared humanity. It is deeper than faith politics. It is deeper than surface level ideas. It's an experienced connection that we have. And to have then somebody out of fear stop that from happening, it just is really painful. Yeah. It's still, and so disappointing. So I was really, it really hit me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So g keep going through your story. I just wanted to make sure we pulled that out. So yeah. you, you got the call, so you I get felt the call, devastated. Felt those things. And then, and then I'm sitting down. I didn't know what to do. Holly had, Holly's been recovering from a pretty major um, surgery. And I was like, I can't go dump this on her right now. She had just had surgery and I was like, okay. So I started to just write it out on Facebook a little bit. And, um, and then I had this really interesting experience where I don't know how to talk about this actually, this is, but it was a very intuitive feeling of having like, it was almost like I saw air quotes saw like there was this strand or a sinew that was that stretched from the bottom of my ankle all the way to Rexburg and it snapped. Like I, it was like all of a sudden I was completely released from, I guess I'll say any sense of giving up authenticity to maintain an attachment with BYU, Idaho. And I kind of dropped into a place of feeling centered and strong and this unusual sense of freedom. So both of those things simultaneously grief and shock and hurt and then also a strange centering strength that felt new and very quiet. They both happened. And uh, yeah, so that's basically how it went down the day of. And the other thing that made this really hard is it's actually been kind of a hard year for me um, in terms of my relationship with the institutional church, um, which again, that does I I love my friends who are LDS and I love them and support them. Period. In the end. And this year, I got this note out of nowhere from my mission, my ex mission president. Carlos Godoy, who's now a very high-ranking general authority in the church. And he just sent me a note on Facebook that said, hey, the talk I'm giving in conference is inspired by thinking about your family. So I hope you'll tune in. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, <laughs> I don't. Anyways, I, didn't, I did not tune in initially. But later, I was hosting a conversation on Facebook, like sort of a supportive conversation to my friends who also felt like they needed to leave the church and just saying, you guys inspire me, your courage. And he actually hopped on and posted his talk in the comments there, which felt really unusual. But the talk was basically don't, don't be a weak link, right? By leaving the church. And that was so out of the blue, like my heart's like pounding in my chest right now. It was so, it just showed me how far away from empathy and understanding we are. Like if you go into a, a room full of wounded people and start to call them weak, <laughs> like what is that? Like we're, it feels like we're so far from each other. And it was so antithetical to my experience because uh, I have had to find a strength that I didn't even know I had to walk away from the faith of my upbringing. I've had to develop a resilience that I would never have had the opportunity to even know existed inside me. And so I was struck by the, there's kind of an irony there between 
you know, someone in his position with all that that entails coming to someone who's like <laughs> dis disenfranchised, excluded, like somebody who's on the margins to say the least of this particular community and being told that they're weak. It, I don't know, it was just so strange. So it took, it was really hard for me to process that, to figure out how to gently push back on that in a way that still humanizes Carlos. Um, but that also stands up for this part of me that's like, please leave me alone. You know, there's this, they always, I, you know, I always heard people say, you know, people can leave the church, but they can't leave it alone. And it was like, well, I just would like for them to leave me alone. <laughs> like, well, that's so public, so right? It's like, it was very public. Like that's to the worldwide church membership. And he didn't tell the whole world's wide church membership that it was for my family. He kept that part of it private, but, right? But yeah, but but, what, but if he tell, he could have just not told you, yeah. So that then you didn't have to like know, yeah. that he was talking about you and your family yeah. to the entire world membership, yeah. Right? Totally. So there was just this thing that was not easy for me. I'm sort of a porous individual. I, I'm still learning how to not take on what people send my way and. Uh, that was really hard and something about this felt can and for my emotional experience it was connected to that experience with carlos combined with then getting banned uh it was just yeah it, and so. people you know 60 percent of our youtube audience has never been mormon they just won't understand sort of like the power and the influence a mission president can have over a, a Mormon return missionary. They're kind of like not just their parent during those two years. In some sense, they're almost like their prophet or even their God mm -hmm. for two years because yeah. they have so much power and influence, right? Yeah, I genuinely believed that obeying him meant obeying God. So um, you're absolutely right. I hadn't even thought about that, but that was a huge part of why that was so charged for me emotionally. It's, it's a very uncomfortable experience to step into your own with somebody who held so much power in the past. Yeah. 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 So it's like speaking about re-injuring, re-wounding him, reaching out to you and making your story anonymously public to the world. Yeah. That's re-traumatizing, I think. And using the word weak. Yeah. Like, like it's like, really? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, because it it's it, not an act of weakness to leave a high demand religion. It's it, an act of yes. courage and strength and resilience. It certainly has been for me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So where do you want to go next? So um, no, so, not the easiest year anyway. Not the easiest year anyways. And then, I mean, I'll just map out. I, this is from, this is the best sense I can make of what happened before the call came. And, and I've, this is from many, many sources. So um, I already mentioned that in November was when they sent my name up the day before. Then I got the call. Um, turns out that there was a single complaint that had been sent uh, to someone uh, that said... Um, that was concerned when they saw that I was coming because they knew I had done the Mormon stories interview four years before and nobody knows who that complaint came from. Okay. So it starts with a complaint started with a complaint apparently. Mm. And then, um, and I think that that went to the, anyways, I want to be really careful that went to the Dean and the vice president eventually. And the vice president then made a call, uh, made the call to disinvite me. Um, and some of the things that was really hard about that is the Dean that sent it up to the vice president. He was my former Bishop and he was the first, uh, Bishop who started those endorsement interviews. If you, if anyone watched our first interview, he was, he was the one that said, okay, Ryan, we need to see where you really are. Like he started to just kind of, so I had a very uncomfortable experience with him as a Bishop. And then at the end, when we moved out of his ward, he was also the one that said, I think we understand each other now, uh, which <laughs> at some point, I'm, yeah, I'm startled at my own willingness to believe people, I guess. <laughs> so, but I was really sad to find out that he sent it up. Um, anyways, and the vice president who made the decision, or at least says that he made the decision, um, 
he's he has claimed kind of total ownership of it. And I later had like a, initially I felt really sad about that because we were colleagues. Actually, he used to teach in the music department and um, <sighs> I was really sad and I felt angry about it. And then later on jumping ahead, I had this kind of amazing experience where I woke up one morning and the anger had simply dissolved. And I, I actually sent him a note just of, just an olive branch, just saying how much I loved him and, and uh, that he must be hurting a lot. Because in my life, the only times I've hurt someone intentionally or not have been when I've been hurting so much that it's spilled out. And if someone, and for him to do that to me means that he must be hurting a lot. So, um, so I kind of sent him a note along those lines. Anyway, so then the dean tells my colleague and friend, my friend calls me, word spreads through the department, uh, and then the um, and then the department really amazingly, my friends in the department of music were all they all disagreed unanimously mm. with the decision to disinvite me. And uh, good so, for them. So yeah, I feel so grateful for them. I mean, and, a, we we've talked about this. We talked about this with David Bakavoy yesterday. The interview hasn't aired yet, but when you're an employed by the church. Mm -hmm. And you've given your career basically to the church. And it's not like BYU-Idaho is the most reputable of universities to spring from to try and get other jobs. Mm -hmm. You're any, any even appearance of support for a cause or an idea that the administration doesn't support puts you at risk. So the fact that, I mean, I'm even a little bit worried for your colleagues that you're talking about their support for you honestly but mm -hmm. i know that you're a thoughtful dude so you know you i know you would have thought that through but i'm just trying to represent how terrifying it would be to be at a byu school as a professor and to in any way show support for something that the that the authorities have have condemned yeah well one of the reasons I feel comfortable talking about it is because it's already been made public. The other reason I feel, I think that there's other ways to see that. I think the fact that they came together unanimously, one, they wanted to affirm, again, this shared sense of shared humanity that we all have. And they um, also wanted to, they also showed a great trust in the new president there. They felt like they could ask him. So what they did is they asked for a meeting with him to discuss it, which is, yes, amazing. Um, but these, you know, these are, these people are totally devoted to the church, to the, to BYU, Idaho, to their students. Like there's nothing in their concern was a matter of challenging any mm, doctrine or anything. It was simply, they just felt they needed to do that. And, uh, and so they met with the president and he decided to uphold the vice president's decision. And to my understanding, um, that was in that meeting that the president specifically stated that it was because of the Mormon stories interview. So people asked him, apparently, I mean, I'm, this is from multiple sources, so I'm doing my best to reconstruct what happened. But apparently they asked him if he had any concerns about the content of my interview. And he said, no, it was just the concern over the association with Mormon stories. So that is kind of how it went down. Okay. Yeah. To my knowledge. Yeah. You know, and that's just me trying to piece together what went down from what lots of people told me. So, but really it's the complaint, you know, I mean, I don't know, like if you've, if you've spoken there many times since, uh, and, surely people knew uh, what I'm thinking is it, it uh, an important factor in this decision would be that somebody complained, mm -hmm. which would then make me wonder who complained and what power influence they have sure. to, to change something that's not to, to try and fix something that hasn't been broken and that's been working mm -hmm. for several years. Right. Yeah. 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 It's to, yeah. That seems plausible to me. <laughs> it's uh, you know, we're for me. I'm leaving. Yeah, what I know there, but mm -hmm. yeah, okay. I think so. 
Yeah, okay. So uh, I guess we go to, like, what's been the response yeah, so to the band? I was super, st- like, absolutely startled that the Salt Lake Tribune wanted to run a story on it. Um, and I met with uh, Peggy Fletcher Stack and just really enjoyed meeting with her. And we, you know, we both really resonated with each other in the sense that we're really supportive of the people in our lives wherever they are. And um, she's, I didn't know this, so she's totally practicing LDS and... Um, we both kind of feel like maybe it's tough to find places of belonging and, um, on either side. And, um, so it was nice to meet with her and, and I was grateful for them being willing to, to publish it. Um, I learned really quickly not to read the social media comments on the Tribune pages because man, it was such a whiplash experience for me because I literally went from that morning having a student come in and let me know that they got in their mission call for the LDS church. And we absolutely celebrated together. It was Mm. like, Hey man, congratulations. I'm so excited for you. You're going to have so many beautiful adventures like, and, uh, and then (laughs) went to the social media comments and saw people saying that, uh, you know, that I would literally using the term antichrist to describe me. It was like, what? So I thought maybe we could get the onion to have a headline that says, you know, jazz professor fulfills apocalyptic prophecy. (laughs) (laughs) But um, anyways, um, there were several responses on my Facebook feed that I thought... Wait, the the comments that you didn't like on the Salt Lake Tribune? They were like on their Facebook page where they're like, here's this article, what do you think? And then it was like there were some that actually scared me. I mean, I was like, this is... Like, does that kind of stuff? Like Maybe. Because, I mean... Consistent with that. Like, can you describe them a little bit? Well, just that they would say, you know, this this person bashing the church, and it's like, whoa, I have never, literally mm-hmm. never done mm-hmm. that. And then, but literally saying, literally calling... I'm try, I can't remember, I just remember that they used the term antichrist to describe me. Um, and mm. people were jumping on like, yeah, like it was just a little scary to me cause I've never been, I've never received comments like that. I've been very fortunate to be able to speak with people, um, in a way that holds space for whoever I'm with. And so that was a new experience for me to have people just making stuff up <laughs> out of, they clearly hadn't read the article. They clearly hadn't, and they were just going after it. So. That was a new experience for me. Never been mm-hmm. trolled like that before, I guess. So, Yeah, okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. So that's when I sent you a note. I was like, man, I don't know how you do this. Um, anyways, so yeah, it might be... I did bring a few comments from my Facebook feed to sort of show some responses that felt meaningful to me after yeah. people learned about me being banned. Yeah, yeah. Um, so should we should we show those? Yeah, let's jump and to those. Maybe read through them. Yeah. Okay. Maybe maybe I'll should I read them and then you respond to them or how yeah, do you want to do that? Yeah, I think that's great. Or yeah. do you want to read them? You you read them. And the first okay. one is like uh, starts with I find this incredibly frustrating. Okay. Yeah. So let me. Okay. And this is from uh, somebody who is a very devoted practicing LDS uh, music educator in the state of Utah. Okay. And an alumnus of BYU-Idaho. Okay, so I'll read the first one. Yeah, start with as an alumni. Uh, As an alumni and one who is still fully in the church. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, let me make sure I get... Uh, Okay, let me... I'm I'm navigating the screen. Okay, it's good. Um, As an alumni and one who is still fully in the church, I find this incredibly frustrating. It can be really hard to have a discussion about the professional merits of my alma mater with other professional musicians and music educators when they exclude highly knowledgeable and talented professionals and experts such as yourself because of a difference in beliefs. Yeah. What do you want to say about that? Just that I think that that, I mean, I, I think it accurately paints the picture that there's a there's a challenge that people are experiencing now, who have gone to BYU Idaho, um, and in terms of being seen as a respected place to have studied, that was interesting to me. Yeah, and I and he's not the only person who's mentioned that to me. 
And, you know, which is interesting to me because again, I'll just, just make sure I affirm like if my colleagues in the music department at BYU Idaho are incredible musicians and teachers and they will, so if you're thinking about sending your children there, they will be well taken care of in that department in every aspect. So this um, doesn't even make you want to say don't, don't attend to BYU Idaho as a musician. I think it just points to a reality that people are feeling this acutely in professional circles. And that's pretty interesting to me. Yeah. So, um, and, and I, I don't know that I want to call this being a devil's advocate, but I do like to practice empathy. And so I'll just, um, respond with what I think is going to be, would be the main response the church or administrators would give in response to this first comment, just to give you a chance to address it, hit it head on. What if they would say, this actually doesn't reflect what happened. You are not being disinvited because of a difference in beliefs. Um, that whatever that jazz musician is that headlined, mm -hmm. we don't know her beliefs. We don't care. Mm -hmm. That's that's misrepresenting what happened. You're being disinvited because it we you know we became aware of the fact that you did an interview on a podcast that we consider to be the the biggest, most successful, most popular anti-Mormon, I'll use their words, I don't believe that's what Mormon Stories is, but they would say, you chose to appear on the world's biggest, most successful anti-Mormon YouTube channel website, mm -hmm. and you chose to openly, not, not have beliefs that were different from the church, but openly express both your disbelief in the church, but also make public criticisms of BYU-Idaho, mm -hmm. um, or at least air dirty laundry. Mm -hmm. And so this, we don't care about the beliefs of, of our participants, but if they go on anti-Mormon web podcasts, and I'm using their words, not mine, if you go on anti-Mormon websites or podcasts and, and criticize the church and BYU-Idaho, that's what this is about. What would your response be to that? Um, first to say again, they have every right to do that. They have every right to frame it that way. Again, I'm not trying to argue against their right to choose this. Um, I would also, that term disbelief, I was going to talk about this later, but let's, let's go into that now. It was one of the things that I was, I was a little disappointed in the headline of the Tribune article, um, which was not created by the author of the article, but, um, because, and I tried to talk about this four years ago, the notion of disbelief, uh, I don't, I guess I would say, I, um, I actually did not speak about my disbelief. I spoke about my direct experience with something inside me pointing me to things I had to do to stay well. And I don't, and to me, the question of belief or disbelief, that either or just doesn't even almost capture the complexity of my experience. Um, but they have every white right to frame it that way. Like I don't, that's, so I wouldn't even push back on that. Um, what's compelling about this is sure, um, maybe the issue isn't a difference of beliefs, like you were saying, but what's interesting about this comment to me is that it means that people in professional circles are feeling a crunch right now in terms of being seen in the ways they'd like to be seen among their peers. And I think that's significant. Yeah. That's all. Really quickly, I want to address kind of a comment or I don't know if it's criticism. JC writes, why does John try to be such an apologist for the church? He channels the church he wishes for, not the one that is. Uh, yeah, and JC, uh, that um, uh, that's your question. I I'll just respond directly and say, what I want to try and do in a world of polarization, in a world of straw man arguments, in a world of bad faith interpretations and um, unhealthy discourse, when I try and represent the church's point of view, 
Partly it's because they won't ever come on the podcast or send anyone to the podcast to represent themselves because that's what I would always rather do. What I'd rather do is have the administrator who did, made this decision come on the podcast and represent himself. Yeah. But the church stopped allowing its people or wanting its people to work with me since they excommunicated me. So that makes it so the church can rarely, if ever, be represented here. But I think it's irresponsible to um, at least m not make a basic attempt at representing the church's point of view when I can, not only so that we don't misinform or miseducate our 60 plus percent never Mormon audience, but also just to model and practice healthy discourse and dialogue. Uh, so anyway, I hope other viewers and listeners aren't annoyed that I responded to that. I feel a little defensive about the the assumptions of of that comment and ryan i don't know i hope i didn't offend you by no. <laughs> representing no. a possibility of the church's oh no not at all that's the it's interesting because a few people have made those comments in my you know on my feeds and my story and it's like i'm not arguing against that the only thing i'm trying to say is this hurt a lot for me i'm really sad about it and um and that it's just much more complex than it has been painted to be. Like I just, yeah. it, it, like on in ev with every single person's experience, it's just more complex than moralistic black and white thinking could make it. So, yeah, 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 yeah. That's all. Okay, and I mean yeah. no disrespect. I just, I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't feel that. Okay. So, all right. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, that's the first comment. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we go to the second? Sure. Okay. S uh, start with, I'm sorry this is happening. Okay, uh, Ryan, I'm sorry this is happening. Uh, let me go ahead and show the visual. Uh, the one thing I feel uh, that is most disappointing is you only share your experiences and how you're healing from your experiences. In all your posts, I've never heard a single negative thing towards another human you love so deeply, and this saddens me. I support you, Ryan. I thought that was beautiful because this is somebody, again, absolutely devout practicing member of the church. Oh, wow. Who said that. And uh, someone who I admire a lot. And so I, it felt important to me, I think, in the wake of what the Tribune felt they could represent versus what they didn't have space for to just that to sh I guess to show that people my friends and former students who are practicing LDS feel the genuineness of my support for them um, anyways absolutely just, it felt like an important piece of the story that hasn't been talked about so absolutely okay so, um and this next one was from a, a mental health professional and it felt really meaningful to me so all right i'll read it. it says ryan i see you and i know your goodness and the delicate path you walk between honoring your journey and being respectful of others on theirs uh i'm sending love to the hurting places today it is hurtful it's meant to be hurtful and it's not okay Thank you for belonging to you, even when that means others don't know how to partner with you. It's a lonely path to honor one's own dignity and the dignity of others. When that level of integrity is considered a threat, you are not alone. I just feel like they put their finger on exactly how I was feeling with such beautiful words and but that idea of learning how to belong to oneself, even when that means that others don't know how to partner with you, that just resonates with me so much in the loneliness of this path of trying to figure out how, uh, how to leave the faith of your upbringing, how, yeah. to, how to step into your own authenticity, and how to support others doing the same thing, even and especially when that means they take paths that caused you harm. I deeply want to be able to hold a space for all of those experiences in my own heart. So I'll just add, you know, I've been thinking a lot about since that Jubilee um, debate that we had with the four ex Mormons and the four Mormons. I don't know if you saw that. I didn't but see that. 
Um, yeah, the, these these Mormon YouTubers like Cardin, Ellis, and Kwaku and others, I I try to make the point just to them even personally that when when Mormons who really like to defend the idea that they're Christian, when Christians act unchristlike, it's the worst possible look and the most counterproductive thing they could do. If if I'm putting on my good my best faith interpretation of what Jesus Christ modeled, you know, why did he why did he associate with um, sex workers? Why did he associate with social outcasts? He he did that clearly in the Bible, New Testament makes it clear he did that to make a point that we treat people, we go the extra mile. When they punch us, we turn the other cheek, right? Like we love our enemies. That's wasn't that what Jesus taught? And so, like, if you're gonna bear the church's name, I'm oh, sorry, if the church is gonna bear Jesus Christ's name, and if they're gonna fight to be called Christians, it seems like the most powerful and um, self-benefiting thing they could do is model Jesus's actual teachings. And if I'm just like reading the New Testament and then thinking about how to apply it to this situation, and I don't mean to swear, but how badass would it be for the church to say, oh yeah, Ryan criticized us. He did a Mormon Stories episode and we're gonna model Christian behavior and invite him anyway, because that's the Christian thing to do versus this, which is it makes them look small, it makes them look petty, it makes them look, it, it, it's not good for the educational look, the academic freedom aspect, and it just makes them look medieval, I think. Mm -hmm. Now that's my little ramble. That's my little rant. Yeah. Do you have a do you have a reaction to that? I mean, I would just it's it's interesting because I personally don't perceive what I've been doing as criticizing the institution of the church. I've been speaking openly about experiences that I had with individuals, uh, and pointing to the fact that for some people, their relationship with the church in these moments has led them to deeper compassion and empathy, and for other people, their relationship to the church and their faith has led them to fear and. I, so to me, I'm not, I, I guess that word kind of grabs me because I really am not, again, that's, I'm just not interested in that, I guess. <laughs> so it just doesn't feel consistent with where I'm coming from. And then uh, the other thing that, I mean, for me, and maybe that's a good segue to this last little quote here, and, but, um, which is from a current bishop, um, but the, uh, I just think it's that we all have these, I see, this is how I see any institution and person. Inside of all of us are the seeds of power and fear and hierarchy and control. And inside of all of us are seeds of empathy and compassion and understanding. And those are side by side in all of us. And, um, and so to me, the reason that I cannot in good conscience bring myself to wholesale condemn or dismiss an institution of religion is that the seeds for its own healing are also there. And those show up in this story too. And I don't know, I, I just, so to me, regardless of how it's perceived when they choose this, there were still there were people of faith who also showed up for me in ways that were incredibly courageous and loving and, th and that to me is what i would i just want to say it's both right and the reason that that matters to me comes down to like a lot of people would get come on and and say things to me like well you know people sometimes people just are people and that's a kind of an age-old view that is often offered in the wake of harmful actions uh, within, within the church. But the reason that's tragic to me is that that means on some level, those people who are saying, well, people will be people, it means they believe that about themselves. They believe that they are the problem 
And my experience is that those people are what's beautiful about any organization, any organization. It's the people that make it beautiful and meaningful. Um, it's not the, yeah. So it's been really, so to me, my response to that idea of whether they're perceived as being uh, medieval, as you said, is that uh, it means that the people, the people who are living from that view are trying to fragment themselves. They're trying to cut off the parts of themselves that they can't find a way to relate to. And uh, that's a painful way to live because that's really that, that desire, that belief that if there's something bad, anything bad, then it's all bad. I talked about that in the first interview too, but that really hurt me. That's what drove my mental illness. And uh, coming to a place where I could instead compassionately relate to more of myself. And as I'm continuing to learn more about what's actually alive inside me and relating to that, I move towards wholeness and I move towards healing and I move away from um, caricaturing myself or others. Mm, beautiful. So. See, that's, that's why, I mean, that's why I'm so outraged is you just hear how thoughtful and loving Ryan is like, how in the world can they do that to someone like this? That's how I feel. <laughs> Thanks, man. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's go to the next one. We yeah. just got, uh, you know, a little bit more. Just one more. Yeah. So uh, I'll read it. Have they listened? Do you want to say who this is or this like is, describe this I'll just this say person? that this is a current bishop. Like this person that wrote this is currently a bishop. <laughs> a Mormon bishop. Yes. And we've had at least, we've had several current and former Mormon bishops on Mormon stories. Lots of Mormon bishops are listening to Mormon stories these days. So for whatever that's worth, church. Um, okay. Let's go ahead and read it. Um, have they listened to your Mormon Stories podcast? Because I found it very genuine and fair to the church, despite it being a story that resulted in leaving the faith. You shared your and Holly's story, meaning you, Ryan. It was not a protest. It was not trying to start a mutiny. It was not a lambasting of the church, nor would I consider anything that you've posted such. It was simply your experience, a very tragic one that I believe everyone should hear is the bishop saying that, because as I said to you after I listened to it, we in the church, particularly church leaders, need to do better. Uh, putting rules and policies ahead of love for individuals is not what Jesus did or taught. They've shot themselves in the foot here. Just look at the number of responses from this, LDS members and disaffected members alike, all reading and mourning with you for a poor decision they've made. I imagine uh, had they let you come, you would have been posting about the amazing experience it was, how grateful you were for their graciousness, and reminiscing about the positive things that you experienced during your time there. I have seen posts like that from you in the past. I have never, nor do I believe any other members of the church have ever felt you are at opposition to them, and in fact, all have felt supported by you as you stated. Thank you, Ryan, for once again sharing your story. As a faithful member of the church, I stand with you. I mourn with you. I comfort you as you stand um, in need of comfort. Wishing you well as you try to grapple with this and move forward. Man, I want this guy. I, I that, want this guy as my bishop. I know, Can I right? have this guy as a bishop? <laughs> for reals. <laughs> it's like, that's it right there. That is That is pastoral care. That's someone saying... I love you. I have a place for you. I will mourn with you. I believe you. Let me put my arms around you and say, you're still my brother. And it meant the world to me that he wrote this. Yeah. Yeah. And it does put in stark contrast the center he's coming from versus the decision. So, yeah. 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 Okay. So has there been a pretty overall heavy response, high, high volume response? Really? Yeah. Unusually. So this seemed to touch base with something pretty strong in a lot of people. So yeah. And we can, let's skip that next one. I think we can hop over that next quote there and just we'll skip go, it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And maybe talk about the t-shirt and all right. So here's a fun, here's a fun little photo. For those who are just listening only, I'll just describe it. 
It's a photo of Ryan in a T-shirt that says, Ryan just wanted to talk about jazz, and it shows a <laughs> trumpet. Uh, and that's and and Ryan, you're wearing you're wearing that shirt right now. Can I you am just wearing show the it, shirt. Show yep. it to the audience. Yep. So there it is. <laughs> Ryan just wanted to talk, to about, talk jazz. about jazz and yeah. play and play the trumpet. Yes. <laughs> and uh, what was funny about it is this was just two friends of mine because this alumni band. There were people who sent notes to me to see if I was going to be there. People flew in from all around the country for this thing. Like it was. We were so excited to see each other, and when these several of my friends who were coming up for that band heard about this, um, <laughs> they just started thinking of making a T-shirt in in a cute and totally harmless "quote unquote" protest, uh, where that was all it was. Like 14 people wearing T-shirts that said Ryan just wanted to talk about jazz. My friends Sean and Nathaniel who collaborated on that and. Um, <laughs> Thanks to them for showing up like that. Um, and uh, is there a place to buy? Julie's asking. Is there a place to buy that T-shirt if people want to? I don't know if there is. I can try. I mean, so many people have asked. I need to. <laughs> I need to reach out to to those guys and be like, "Hey, you, we got to get this up." So, <laughs> um, I thought maybe it'd be cool to use it to maybe create a scholarship fund for a student or something. Um, I love but, it. But yeah, the. So I just I just thought it was kind of hilarious and quirky and it also meant so much to me. My so I when I actually did end up me and my brother and one of my friends, we actually I, I was not going to go to the festival at all, but we jumped in a car and drove up for the last night of the festival. You went anyway. How classy. Not to, not to I wasn't trying to make waves, but these people who made these t-shirts and sending me so much support and I just want to go see these people who I love. So we went up together and man, it was on one side, it was so amazing to feel their love and support, and the other side was it was so sad to be saying goodbye to those halls for the last time. Because my dad taught there. I grew up in that building. That concert hall is like a sacred space to me. Um, I've had so many experiences there, so many mentors, so many ghosts wandering those halls for me, and and to to be in that in in the concert hall there and take a picture with all these people wearing this hilarious shirt um it meant a lot to me it was also really tender we went to the show that night to try and hear and i just i couldn't stay mm. it just hurt too much mm. so so i yeah i texted my bro and my and my friend and said uh, let's leave after the next song. I can't stay here. Mm. Um, so it was just a really, it was, what an experience. It was all this love and support and, and also just all this hurt. Cause it's, it's really, I was startled by how hard it was to say goodbye to that place. So, but now I've kind of said goodbye to everything, you know, it's like, it's time to move on. Yeah like all the way mm. so well i'm so sorry and i it really does feel abusive to me this type of behavior i mean as someone who's been excommunicated by the church literally for like speaking up for lgbt people giving a ted talk in support of lgbt mormons yeah honestly giving a ted talk for a position that now the church kind of embraces but then back then they didn't but then also because i wouldn't take the podcast down yeah. Like it just feels wrong. It feels violent and violent may feel like a very strong word, but after Margie and I experienced my excommunication, spiritual and psychological violence was the only term that really captured it for us. And I would never, I don't, I mean, I don't, yeah. Yes. I just, that resonates with me completely. It is such a strange discombobulating experience to be, you know, banned from that. <laughs> so yeah. um, it does feel like it was intended to hurt and to isolate. And we didn't read that fifth quote, but one of the interesting things, if anyone's interested, is that by common consent had a, had a post about this where they tie, they basically, they're talking about strategies that have been showing up in CES over the last couple of years and they and they kind of include in the list like you know 
You want to keep uh, faculty from expressing support for LGBTQ plus individuals? Form a secret ecclesiastical clearance office using unnamed criteria to fire respected adjuncts, which happened, uh, right? And they just, they kind of make a list of things and then they end by saying, you know, um, are you desperate to ensure that no disaffected former faculty tells their story of ecclesiastical abuse? Then invite them to perform in clinic at a jazz festival where, quote, Ryan just wanted to talk about jazz and then retract the invitation one day before the festival begins <laughs> and ban him from performing his trumpet on the campus where he received his degree and taught for over a decade. And I thought that was fascinating to see them put that in a string of behaviors that they perceive as being calculated and intentional to keep people feeling wary about speaking and supporting yeah. vulnerable populations. And anyway, yeah. so that was interesting to me. I, I had not thought of it that way at all. So, mm. and then the last thing I'll say about the support that was amazing is that a dear friend of mine, also a former Bishop current practicing LDS, he is a, he, uh, he used to teach trumpet at BYU Provo. Now he teaches at, uh, at Indiana University, which depending on who you talk with at any given year is either the number one or number two music program in the country. And he's also a former president of the International Trumpet Guild. So he has, he's very highly visible in the trumpet community. And he just really stepped up <laughs> in support of me. He sent a letter to the BYU administration um, telling them why he felt this was a really a damaging decision to make. And, uh, He's just been so vocal about that. And so to have that support, and he also said in the letter that that he's going to make sure that he does what he can to amplify my influence because he trusts me as a teacher and an artist. So I'm looking forward to having a chance to go collaborate with him at Indiana on on some master classes. But the bottom line is, is having that support from that level of the international trumpet community also felt so important and because you're kind of a big deal. So <laughs> you were president, really, again, you really were president bad at of handling what? flattery. Sorry. <laughs> you were um, president of like the Global Association of Trumpet Jazz People or whatever. <laughs> no, not me, him. Yeah. So. But you had some position. Uh, well, I, pu I mean, I, I publish, I, I do interviews for the International Trumpet Guild Journal, and I have, and I'm very excited about the things that have unfolded in my career. Um, and, but it just meant the world to me to have Jason show up for me like mm, that. So yeah. thanks, man. Yeah. Well, here's the, here's the photo again. Ryan just wanted to talk about jazz. <laughs> um, it's such yeah. a funny shirt. So. Well, I'm so sorry this happened, Ryan. And I'm, thanks, man. Um, let me just share so many cool comments have come in. I'll just, I'll put you on the screen and then share the comments and you can say whatever you want. Um, Martha writes big hugs. Um, JC writes uh, the claim that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints does not shun people is proven false here. Um, uh, let's see. Stuart writes, I don't think this is surprising to anyone who understands the LDS Church and the oaths members take to secrecy. I'm positive those, and I'll, I'll add to not criticizing the church's leaders, I'm positive those who ultimately made the decision do not personally know Ryan um, and probably haven't watched the podcast. Do you have a response to that? Um, the, the people who are claiming responsibility for the decision uh, do know me uh, and well, and that was part of why it hurt. Why it hurt. Yeah. Yeah. But the, what was the other part of that? Oh, but confident they have not watched the podcast. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Latter-day Digest writes, silence is violence. Um, mm. David writes, what a horror story. I am a retired professor. Ryan's treatment is a disastrous, is disastrous for education and for humanity. I mean, that's a strong statement, but that's how they wow. feel. Martha writes, my psychologist says that rejection from our tribe registers on the brain in exactly the same way as physical violence. Wow. Did you know that? I did not know that. Hmm. But that makes sense out of my body's response to getting the news. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think we fear death when the tribe rejects us. Wow. Uh, well, Juanita Joe Sherman. That. What's that? I'm going to have to sit with that for a while. That's yeah. heavy. Yeah. I think evolutionarily, when you go against the tribe, they, they, yeah. take, they take care of you. Totally. In a not so good way. So, I mean, that's probably why we've evolved mm. to feel like going against the tribe or being rejected by the tribe is death because just a few hundred years ago, it was death. You know? Right. Yeah. Um, Jonita writes, uh, this is just one of the reasons I don't join the Mormon church. Uh, there are so many pros, but the cons definitely outnumber and ruin what heavenly father wants for us. And that's mm -hmm. the point I was trying to make is like, how is this a good look? Like, even if we're just not saying what's moral, what's intelligent, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. How is this a good look? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Lady Dane Winters writes, I want that shirt. <laughs> I'm going to reach out to Sean and Nathaniel, see what they can do. So, so come back into the description <laughs> later or check out Ryan's Facebook page. Maybe he'll make that possible. Uh, Sandy writes, jazz is so uplifting, energetic, and happy. Uh, Mormon Tabernacle Choir, I think they're saying not so much. I actually love the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. Me too. You do too? Yeah. 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 Although it'd be okay if they, no, I won't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, I love the tab cats as they're now called, Yeah, which is a very jazz sounding name. Yeah. Uh, Max writes, dear BYU Idaho banning such a good young man as he is just denied, uh, uh, sorry, banning such a good young man as he is, um, just denied your students the opportunity of learning from a talented person and also just tarnished the church and the university. Mm. Response to that? No, nope. <laughs> I don't know. I, I appreciate all of these expressions of support. You um, really do feel so vulnerable. Like I've, this is a level of vulnerability I've never felt before. Yeah. And so these reassurances are deeply meaningful. So thank you. Let's everyone. read it. Let's read a few more. Um, JC writes, yes, let's do a fundraiser for kids in music so cool um the mormon atheist writes rfm should host a jazz festival <laughs> i like that idea or mormon stories jc writes where do i get that shirt lots of people want that shirt uh carrie writes music is so primal and transcends all religiosity mm. i think religions co-opt music or or incorporate music much to their benefit by the way uh, carrie goes on to write i feel like this is why it's elicited such visceral, visceral responses from people. Mm. That and Ryan is an absolute sweetheart. Oh, that's super sweet. <laughs> that's a nice comment. That's so nice. Um, uh, Karen writes, would Jesus do this? Isn't that uh, the standard? So just an idea that shouldn't we be doing what Jesus would do as a Christian church? Uh, Latter Day Digest says, "Let's do a jazz fest at Sunstone, and I'll say it Thrive. Maybe we should have you perform at an upcoming Thrive. Let's do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think we talked about that in the past. I don't know why that hasn't happened. Has that happened? Mm -mm. You haven't performed yet. We got to mm -hmm. do that. We got to make that happen. The Mormon Inquisition. I think that might catch on. Mark your calendars. Uh oh, now they're talking about a Mormon Inquisition. Whoa! I don't think there's ever not been an Inquisition <laughs> in, in my experience." Not to be cynical, but um, when I think jazz, I think Rexburg, Idaho. That's the comment from Domino. <laughs> Domino crazy. Now, wait a minute. The truth is there's some bad <laughs> mofos up there. That's like people who really play up there, So, which is kind of amazing. So, But yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll just read a couple more because uh, you said it makes you feel good. Caitlin writes... <laughs> First time watching a live stream here. Love the content happening here. I've learned so much as a never religious individual. Fascinating yet heartbreaking stuff. Keep up the positive, healthy work. Isn't that mm. cool that that we're able to reach never Mormons? Yeah. Like hundreds of thousands of subscribers so who have cool. never been Mormon? That's really cool. Super cool. Yep. Um, it's almost like we're all human, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Janice so. writes, I think John asks measured questions in order to get the most out of whoever he's interviewing. Yeah, thank you, Janice, for that interpretation. I also just want to have the fullest conversation. And again, I like this idea of a steel man where you're responding to the best arguments of your opponent, 
not straw man where you're setting up fake artificial arguments that your opponent's not even making. I just think that leads to better understanding. Yeah. I think we need more empathy, less polarization, but thanks for, uh, for understanding. All right. I think, uh, I think that's that's all I'll read for now. Yeah. That's what great. I'll just say in close, Ryan, is thank you to you and Holly. Thanks to you both for your courage in telling your story. I'm sure it's helped many, many people, um, and I'm sure it's going to help more. So in the one sense, this Barbara Streisand effect, I think the church is actually just going to promote you and Holly and your your story more as a result of this, which is positive in mm. my view. I'm really sorry it came at the sacrifice of your relationship with BYU-Idaho faculty and students or staff, or at least your ability to interact with them in a professional way. But I'm also um, deeply grateful for your vulnerability and your willingness to tell your story because just the Sully Tribune article caused you a lot of stress, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's, I had to completely unplug from the response. I sent Peggy a note and said, what do you do with these kinds of comments? And she just said, stay as far away as possible. You know, it's like, yeah, that's, there's no way to get in and yeah. invite people into experiencing your humanity when it starts from that place. So, yeah. yeah. But what's weird is we've grown so much since you interviewed this episode, mm -hmm. we'll get more views than all your episodes in the past combined. Wow. And then when we add sort of like the rebroadcast of your and Holly's episode, mm -hmm. it's going to get a ton of views. And so wow. I'm excited about that. Cool. But thanks for your vulnerability because when you get that much exposure, it does come at a toll, even if it's just cognitive or emotional or psychological load. Yeah. That's significant. So thank I, you for that. I feel that. I'm, yeah. But I'm going to end as you begun. What's that fancy word you used at the very beginning? Oh, with the telomeres? Yeah. Like yeah. I do firmly believe that you – um, the, the highest probability is you're going to be healthier, psychologically healthier and happier for telling the story, for standing in your truth. And that's just my experience. And so I'm grateful you're helping others, but I'm also grateful that you're giving yourself the best shot at being as healthy as possible by standing up and speaking your truth. So I'm glad for you that <laughs> Thanks, you did this. Man. Yeah, no, I am. I'm glad too. I just, I just feel like you mentioned that things are so polarized now. I think that maybe sometimes I wonder if what feels scary about me is that I simply will not villainize people wherever they are. That, that, and the narrative is that that's what I should be doing, right? That if, since I left the church, I should be painting some sort of oversimplified, reductive caricature of people and institutions. And I just, I know that what I'm yearning for is to find connection with people that, that, that can see and honor the wholeness of who I am. And I really, really hope to continue to learn how to practice offering that to other people. And and I know that there are a lot of my friends on both sides of the question of inside or outside of the LDS church who also hold those values very dear. And um, so I appreciate the opportunity to come in and try and create a space that isn't either or, but that just is a yes and, because that's, I think, more important than ever. Love and that's it. why I love music. Yeah. Music is one of the last spaces left where we can sit down with people who view the world very differently than we do and experience directly our shared humanity. And that's like, it's never felt more important to me than it does now. Amen. So. Okay, I'm going to just share a couple more because there's some really good ones. So Sherry, Sherry writes, this is one of the most beautiful stories I've listened to. My deepest compassion to this man and his family so thank you, uh, Cherry or Sherry, for that. JC writes, silence is them winning. I, I love that. When people, you know, silence is the enabler, silence is the killer. Whistleblowers and, and people who speak up are the ones that make a difference. So I'm super grateful for that. Martha T. writes, you are such an amazing person. That is so beautiful. Um, so more compliments. Mm. Maven writes something interesting. She writes, I spoke with someone 
recently who has insider knowledge that every guest on Mormon Stories podcast has a file in the church's strengthening the church membership committee. So it's like a <laughs> it's like a KGB CIA kind of file yeah. system kept on church members. That actually so speaking of <laughs> files, BYU Idaho did still pay me. So let me just put that out That's there. That's good. Yeah. So, you know, musicians everywhere just get the gig and then speak <laughs> out and then you get free money. No, I'm kidding. Don't do that. Um, but they did still pay me, which I really appreciate. And they asked me for an invoice. <laughs> and because I was feeling somewhat immature, I guess. Salty. I put at the top of my invoice, Ryan Nielsen, darling child of BYU-Idaho. Because something <laughs> just tickles me to death to think that they have to keep that on file for three years for, <laughs> for auditing purposes. <laughs> so I know that's kind of stupid, but. <laughs> I love it. Um, Amanda writes, it takes such tremendous strength to walk away from the church when it's all you've ever known. I hold space for you and your family, and I'm incredibly inspired by your strength. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you, Amanda, for sharing that. Four more, I promise. Um, Jenna writes, I worked with Ryan's mom, lovely woman, just so proud of you, Ryan. Mm. So that's nice. Um, and then Doctor Without Dogma says, ran into these sentiments during my professional training. It exists. Actions like this by BYU-Idaho just feed into this. It is not a badge of honor, but a curse to have attended an LDS school. And that's strong. I attended BYU. I don't know that I feel that way, but I totally validate people who do. Because mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of good that happens at these BYU schools. Last two, Anja Von Fell writes, Mormon Church's response is totally in line with Hollett's musket speech. So basically, this is just mm. touching on the idea that the church is terrified, they're losing members, and they're having all these, let's just say, more politically conservative members, preppers, uh, et cetera, who are angry that the church is getting too liberal. Mm. And so I think, and there's just this mass wave of disaffection that the church doesn't want to admit is happening. And I think hmm. the church is terrified that they're losing people. I think. I see this literally as a trauma response. Like the way I was treated is a, is simply a, a level of hurt that has not healed that is still being placed on other people. Yeah. Yeah. Unhealed trauma. Yeah. Hurt people, hurt people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Last one from a BYU Idaho alum. As a former BYU Idaho grad, I can see them making this decision. So worried about image and petty um, with their rules. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway. All right. Well, Ryan Nielsen, what's next for you? Get, let's end on a positive note. Okay. Other than people buying this T-shirt, once you tell them how. What, <laughs> yeah. What's in the future? So in the future, like personally, just as a very quick update, um, I'm like I said, I've been really drawn to understanding the nature of trauma, and I just started actually doing some training with a modality called body dreaming by a brilliant Irish therapist by the name of Marion Dunlay. I think anybody who uh, has experienced uh, religious abuse or trauma may find something meaningful in her work. So I'll just put that out there. Um, relationally, Holly and I are, I just feel super lucky to be married to Holly. She's, we just keep waking up every morning and choosing each other. Um, and that's just a beautiful thing and letting each other change and standing by each other while we do. So um, she couldn't come today, um, but yeah, feel so grateful and lucky to be with her. In terms of parenting, uh, we've been through so much over the last few years post-pandemic, and we're very much on an adventure of learning how to deeply trust um, our own children's interior lives and support them in that rather than trying to control outcomes. Um, and then professionally, uh, have an album coming out this year. I've already started putting some of the videos on my YouTube channel. Total dream project for me. Two, two recording sessions, one in Chicago, one in North Carolina with musicians like Bobby Broom and Kobe Watkins and Christian Dillingham, Ryan Hansler, Will Ledbetter, uh, unbelievable jazz musicians. So to be in a space <laughs> swinging with those guys is <laughs> just so delightfully fun for me. Um, and, uh, yeah. And then the book coming out. So lots Somebody, going some... on, lots of beautiful things. So many beautiful things have been unfolding over the last four years. 
And if you're someone who can sense deeply that you need to move beyond the tradition of your upbringing, I just want to say out loud that the healing is out there, or it's rather in you, and, and you can access it and keep developing and unfolding into beautiful, beautiful, beautiful things. I just want to affirm that. Love it. So, um, JC wants to know what's the name of your jazz group and how can people hire you? Um, you can, you can go to ryanstrumpet.com to find me. Um, and the jazz group I play with, um, I'm the trumpeter in the Kobe Watkins group tet. That's an amazing group of individual musicians. Um, and, uh, and then my own group is just the Ryan Nielsen quartet. So, so yeah. Beautiful. Look for the album Triple B Blues. It's coming. It's gonna gonna be released soon. So, is there an email? Um, to reach out I'll to have you? to get. I'll have to get one to you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll just show really quickly again. The YouTube channel is Ryan's Trumpet, mm -hmm. spelled exactly as it sounds, and then um, as well, uh, check that out. And the book is the Classroom Guide to Jazz Improvisation coming out soon by Oxford University Press, which is not, uh, you know, not a insignificant publisher. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, I'm thrilled about that. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, and then finally, the episode, the Mormon Stories episode that we're going to figure out how to rebroadcast probably is Spiritual Abuse and Suicidality at BYU-Idaho, Ryan and Holly Nielsen. And again, a shout out to Holly. She's amazing. And she we is love her. amazing. Yeah. All right, Ryan, you take care. Keep Thanks, doing John. good things. You too, man. And uh, come back, come back whenever you want. Okay. All right. And be way Idaho. There's a, you know, Jesus and the Mormon church have given us the formula for repentance. All you got to do is apologize to Ryan for <laughs> disinviting him and um, make amends and then invite him next time. And you, you have the formula. You taught us, Mormon Church, you taught us the formula for repentance. <laughs> Follow that path. Apologize to Ryan. Make it right. Give him some restitution. Throw him a couple bones. Give him a couple gigs. <laughs> and, uh, and then invite him back, and you can make this right. Right, Ryan? <laughs> hey, I would, I would be grateful to sit down with any of my colleagues there anytime, even the ones who made this decision and give them a hug. So. All right. Yeah. All right. Thanks again, Ryan. Thanks everyone Thanks, for joining John. us today on Mormon stories. Be good to each other, be kind to each other, and we'll see you all again uh, really soon. Show them that t-shirt one last time. <laughs> Ryan just wanted to play jazz. All right. <laughs> see everyone.